Okay, another, another fallacy. And here, I fault not only the critics of the bell curve, but Hernstein and Murray themselves. I think they stumble very badly here. And that is the claim that one hears, that even if the races differ in intelligence genetically, it doesn't matter. Hernstein and Murray themselves say this in a widely cited passage. Uh, you might recall it. I guess probably most of you here have read or looked at the bell curve. Uh, they say it doesn't matter whether the difference in intelligence is caused by genes or caused by environment. The important thing about the gap is that it's very, very difficult to get rid of. So basically, Hernstein and Murray were saying, don't kick us, don't be mad at us. We're going to say something that's going to get you mad, but we're going to take it back right away to show we're nice guys. A genetic difference exists, but it really doesn't matter, and I'm even going to say I don't care about it. So please don't criticize me. And a lot of good that that did. Just shows you might as well get hung for a sheep as a lamb. If you're going to say it, you might as well go for it. In any case, In any case, this is a huge mistake. Nothing could be more important than the cause of the race gap. Everything hinges on whether it's genetic or environmental. Let me explain why I, this is important, and this really is a philosophical point and uh, sort of a justification for a philosopher getting into the thing in the first place. What Hernstein and Murray are assuming just as their critics are assuming, the uh, Jerry Hirsches, the Goldbergers and Manskys, the Blocks, the Jenks, the Lewantons of the world, the assumption that they both share is that the only relevant moral, social, policy, and practical questions are forward-looking questions. Namely, okay, we've got this difference. What do we do about it? Once you make that assumption, then indeed it's true that it doesn't matter where the difference came from. Because what Hernstein and Murray say is the difference apparently is impossible to get rid of, or at least very difficult to get rid of, and nothing we've tried has succeeded. Given that it's impossible to get rid of, why don't we reconcile ourselves to that fact, and there the argument ends. N never mind where it came from, let's just get used to the fact that we can't get rid of the difference. But that's not what matters at all. It's not what matters at all, and I'll explain it by a simple analogy, or maybe a variation on an analogy I've used before. Somebody comes into a court of law with a broken leg, and he sues you for $5 million. Now suppose the judge told you that the following defenses were available. One, you could say, broken legs are impossible to heal, so don't sue me. Two, it happened so long ago that the statute of limitations ran out. Three, it was my parents that broke your leg, not me. Suppose you said, but look, I didn't break his leg. The judge says, you're not allowed to use that defense. You can point out that therapy is too expensive, that he shouldn't try to fix his broken leg, but the one thing you can't say is whether you, you can't argue is whether you broke his leg or not. Now this would obviously be a miscarriage of justice because what is the crucial question on which hinges whether you should pay him for the broken leg? There's only one question, and that is whether in the past you broke his leg. It doesn't matter how easy it is to fix a broken leg, it's whether you broke his leg. Questions of responsibility, compensatory liability, blame, and guilt are all questions about the past, not questions about the future. Now, the claims made against whites are very like claims made about you, the alleged leg breaker. Blacks present themselves and say, look, we do very poorly academically, we do very poorly vocationally, um, we have marital instability, we commit a lot of crimes. You did it to us. You owe us compensation. Now, if you only look at the future, if you only look at the future, that charge cannot be answered. It is pointless to say, well, all right, we did this to you, but it's going to be impossible to fix, so don't bother us. That would be a ridiculous thing to say and doesn't satisfy anybody. That's, in effect, what Hernstein and Murray are advising that we do. 
The only proper answer, the only proper answer is to say, it's not our fault that you're in this situation. This is not the effect of something that whites did to you. This is the effect of something that God or revolution did. It doesn't do any good to say, as many sort of wishy-washy critics of affirmative action say, that the immediate cause of black deficiencies are characteristics of black culture, the, the failure of a work ethic to take hold, uh, very high illegitimacy rates, the fact that school performance isn't highly valued, because what is the obvious answer that's always given by advocates of affirmative action when conservatives make that rebuttal, when they point to defects in the black culture? What advocates of affirmative action always say is, yes, but why do those defects exist? They exist because of slavery. They exist because of racism. They exist because of this and that. And then comes out all the litany of things that whites did to them. So at the next remove, you get the same argument again. Why are blacks unpunctual? Because working is identified with slavery. I've heard this, I think uh, Dinesh D'Souza makes this argument. Why do blacks steal? Because blacks steal, because it's stealing from the slave master and the slave master is not really entitled to what he owns. So defenders of affirmative action, if you simply point out the immediate causes of the race difference in achievement, start blaming whites all over again. The only way to attack that argument is to go right to the roots. You have to say, no, these characteristics of black culture, for better or for worse, are due to factors which whites are not responsible for. They're due to genetic differences in the makeup of the two groups. Therefore, since we're not responsible, we didn't bring about these deficiencies whose immediate consequences are inferior achievement, we're not compensatorily liable for this inferior achievement. We don't owe you anything for it. Without that argument, if you just look at the future, if you just look what practically can be done, you're never going to lift the accusation of guilt from whites, and it's the accusation of guilt applied to whites that's the engine that keeps everything going. So, and just to sum up, the the big thing is to say constantly that nothing could be more important than the cause of these race differences. Not whether they're easy to get rid of, not whether they're hard to get rid of, not whether we can get rid of them by taking, bringing Michael Kinsley and dumping him in Harlem and vice versa. None of that really matters from a moral and practical point of view. All that matters is the cause of the things.